Okay, welcome everyone. So we started talking about greedy algorithms last time, and uh, we started uh, looking at a very specific algorithm, a greedy algorithm, for a very specific problem, namely for finding a so-called uh, minimum spanning tree in a, in a graph. And this algorithm was uh, first cause algorithm. And we stopped with an example, and uh, I replaced my previous description, as you can see here in, the, in this pseudocode with uh, a nicer written version of it. So I hope everyone can read this. Um, just to remind everyone how, the, how this cruise call algorithm works, uh, we start from an empty set of edges, and then we always find in each step the lightest edge that doesn't introduce any cycle into our current set of edges. And um, this works because of the so-called cut property, where we showed that Whenever we have a set of edges that are part of a minimum spanning tree, whenever I can find a cut um, that respects the set of edges and I find the lightest edge across this cut, then it's safe to add this edge to my current set uh, of uh, edges and um, extend this then to a set of edges that will still be part of some minimum spanning tree. And the cut implicitly in Kruskal uh, contains all nodes that are part of the connected component of one side of the edge that you're about to add. So remember in cruz at edge each step, you have a selection of connected components, sort of partial trees, um, and you're always looking for an edge to add between two different components, never within a component, because that would introduce a cycle. Uh, and so whenever you do this and you add, you're about to add an edge, you can consider sort of the the cuts that contains the nodes on one side, the connected component on one side that this new edge will connect. Um, and the lightest edge across this cut will be the edge that you're adding within sort of in this cruise call uh, scheme. And we had an example. And so where I wanna continue now is uh, at defining the runtime or uh, analyzing the runtime of this algorithm. Or was there any question related to this to the previous class about cruise call and greedy algorithm in general? If not, the, the running time, as you have if sort of a quick look at this, uh, the description of this algorithm, you see that we have this initial for loop where we uh, call this function called make set. This will simply create sets that contain individual nodes. So every set will contain a single node in this case. And uh, in this step, we're, we're sorting our edges in a non decreasing order by the weights because we want to start with the cheapest edge and then keep on going with uh, heavier edges. And the last loop here goes over all edges in this sorted order and tries to add this edge, provided this edge doesn't introduce any cycle. And whether or not this edge introduces a cycle will be determined in this if clause where you can see that we try to compare the representatives of the two sets of the connected components that this new edge is about to, to connect. So I have these three functions essentially. I have make set, I have a find set for a given element, and I have a union function that takes two sets to disjoint sets and merges them to a common set. And so the running time of this algorithm clearly depends on the running time of these uh, three functions. Yeah. yeah. So essentially now to def define the running time of this algorithm, we have to define the runtime of these uh, three functions. And it will depend on how we exactly implement this, these uh, three functions or the data structure that will support these uh, three functions of find set, union, and, and make set. So the first suggestion how to implement such a data structure is simply by using a, a linked list. So I'll go again back and forth between typing and, and writing. Um, this makes it probably easier to read. So let's have a look at the the running time of uh, this algorithm, which we said depends on these three functions, so depends on how we really implement make set and find set and the union function. And one way to do this is simply using uh, linked lists.
in the following way. So let's say we have uh, three elements that you want to can, uh, that you want to represent in our set. We have element A, which will point to element P, a B, and B will be an element that points to element C. And we represent the set uh, using a, a header, a head pointer that points to the first element in the list. And we have a tail pointer that points to the last element of the set. And in addition, and you will see in a second why, we will keep backward pointers from every element to the head of this set. This way. Okay, so this is one way to, to represent such a set. Now, how does this uh, representation support make set, find set, and, uh, and union? Make set is, is very simple. Look at make set. So make set meaning we're introducing this data structure for a set that contains a single element. Sorry, make set. We will simply introduce um, a head that points to that element, to that single element V, and a tail, in this case, that points to the same element. Plus, again, a backward pointer from V to the head. So creating such a data structure for an element of our set that contains a single element, element is trivial. How about find sets? If you want to find the set that contains a given element V, any suggestion how we would do that in this case, if you represent our sets in that way? And so note that we can represent the set by any elements. So I didn't really point out the, the order in which we store these elements, but we can take the first element as a representative for the set. In general, this strategy will depend on, on the particular application. For our case, it doesn't really matter which element we take uh, as a representative set. We just want to make sure that if I call this function for two different sets, for two different elements in my set, I want to get the same answer. And if I have two different sets and I call this, uh, the function for two different elements from two different sets, I want to get sort of a different answer. Yeah. Exactly. I can use the head as the, the representative, sort of the representative element for my set, or maybe it's more intuitive to say, uh, but conceptually the same, if you take the first element of the list to which head points to. So essentially in this case, you would only have to jump back on this backward pointer, check the, the, the head of this list and take the first element. And this is your representative of your current set. So find set would simply return the head, as you said, or the first element that head points to. Return head does exactly that. And the third operation that we want to support, as we said, is the union function. So let's say we have uh, two sets now, the set that's shown already, and the second set that will contain two elements, let's say D and E. And again, we have uh, a head pointing to the first element and the tail pointing to the last element in the set. Any suggestion how we would create now a set that contains the union of the elements of these two sets? No? So you have these two sets in this representation, you wanna create one set that looks exactly like this, except that it contains all the elements. It contains A, B, C, D, E. How would you, how would you do that? Yeah, exactly. You would concatenate in the sense that you would just take the tail of one set and let it point to the head of the other set. Any suggestion on which one we point to which one? Is there, does it matter? Oh, yeah. Yeah, good point. This is where I wanted to go uh, to. So we will have to adjust the, the header, the, the pointers to heads to identify the set. 
And the strategy will actually also make a suggestion implicitly which set we, concat we concatenate onto which set. So the trick is to keep the representative of the new set as one of the representatives of the two sets. So we don't have to update all the heads. We start from one set and just add the elements of the second set. And then we only have to update the head pointers of the second set that we have attached to the previous set. And so to minimize our work, which set would you attach to which set? Yeah, exactly. So we attach the one with uh, fewer elements to the one with, uh, with more elements. So the idea of uh, the union function here. So let's say union UB. So these are two elements of two different sets. It concatenates the smaller onto the larger and updates the heads. Yeah, so here's an example. <clears throat> Let's say for our two sets, we call union of A and D. So these are two elements of the two sets. Um, and we said we want to concatenate the smaller into the larger. So I start from the larger one, which will remain pretty much unchanged. So I still have the header or head pointing to A, A to B. B to C, and then I use C and let it point to the head of the second set. So C to D and D to E. And the tail of the set will be E. And as you said, while A and B and C are still pointing to the right head. So here we don't have to change anything. For the two new elements, D and E will have to update these pointers to the, to, the, to the representative element of the set and make D points now to the head of the previous set. And uh, the same is true for E. Okay, so this is how the new set would look like. And what I have to do really, the main work here is to update the pointers of the elements of the smaller sets to the representative of this new set. So in this case, we need to update big O of the minimum of the length of the set containing A and the length of the set containing D. Uh, many heads. And is this good or bad? Difficult to tell, really. Uh, in the worst case, it's not really much. It can't be much better than 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 O of n because the two sets that I'm trying to merge could be both like a, like a constant fraction of the entire set of nodes. So the, the asymptotic, in terms of asymptotic runtime, this is still order of n, and we didn't gain uh, a lot in the worst case. However, this, these bad cases can't happen too many often, because every time we have to update the head of an element, this happens because this element is part of the smaller of the two sets. And so in the next step, this element will be part of a set that is at least two times the size of the, the previous set that it contained it. So in every, in every step, the size of the set that contains a particular element will um, at least double. And that's why the, the total number of updates for a given element can be at most a logarithmic number of the total number of nodes. The question here? No, you. No, so for every element, we, we can say that this will happen at most log number of the nodes many times. 
So for all nodes, this will be V log V. So number of nodes times log number of nodes. So everything I said about doubling the size is referring to like one element. That this element will every time, every time you change the head of a given element, you do this because it will be part in the next step of a set that is at least double the size of the previous set. And so you have only a logarithmic number of updates per element. Let's write this down. So, and this of course um, assumes that a, the update of a single head will take constant time, which, which makes uh, totally sense. So if, the up, if updating a single uh, head is uh, constant, sort of or, or a big O of one, then uh, the question is how much does the union cost as part of this Kruskal algorithm? So how much does uh, union uh, cost in Kruskal? And then we reason that a head pointer of some element, it's only updated if that element is part of the smaller list that's, that, that are being joined. So a head pointer of an element X is only updated if uh, it's part of the smaller list. And therefore, the list containing this particular element will double in size, at least double in size. And that means that each, the head pointer of every node will, up, will be updated at most uh, log, a logarithmic number of times, a log, logarithm in the number of nodes. So each uh, node, node's head pointer. gets updated at most uh, log v times. And this is to the base two, of course. Does this make sense to everyone? So what's the running time that we get in this case? Total running time of Kruskal in this case. If you look back to the, to the pseudocode we said in this first loop here, we will have to call a number of nodes, many uh, make sets functions. Make sets here is just uh, creating a head and a tail for a single element, so it takes constant time. So the, therefore, the running time for this part of the algorithm will be a big O of number of nodes. So we have a big O cardinality of V for all the make sets. Then we have to sort the edges here. In the second step, we have to sort the edges, which we all know takes E log E time. So we have big O of uh, number of edges times the logarithm of the number of edges, um, which is in our, which is here the same as E log V. To sort the edges. So why can we write E log V instead of E log E? Well, E is at most V squared. And taking the logarithm of the squared really doesn't, doesn't matter. So we don't care about the squared. This will be sort of a constant in the, in the big O and that's why we get rid of this. So we have E log V for um, sorting the edges. And then the second, the last part of, the, of this algorithm is here where we go through all edges and try to find out if we can add, add, add this edge to our current set of uh, edges. And uh, 
the main work we do here. So we said the find within this loop is, is doesn't cost us anything. Find is uh, we can do in constant time. We have this, these backward pointers, but for all the unions, we have to spend v log v time, log v because of the, the analysis that we just did and v because there's v many of these nodes. So the total time for all unions in this case will be order of v log v. For all units. And so total running time goes call is the dominated by E log V by the sorting essentially. So we have E log V time for this algorithm. Okay, makes sense to everyone. This is the runtime of Kluskal using this linked list implementation of uh, this joint set operations. Um, if there's no question, um, in the next step, we want to improve this uh, such that we don't get this in the average case, this log V uh, part of the updates of the heads. But we want to have this in the in the worst case. So we want to have uh, that every single operation takes at most log v uh, instead of having this uh, this average uh, case argument. Um, because now, as as I said, it can happen that a single operation takes actually uh, in the worst case more than a logarithmic number of time. And so, an alternative way to represent our disjoint sets instead of using linked lists is using uh, rooted trees. How would that look like? This is uh, again very intuitive. You can represent a set with a rooted tree instead of a linked list. And we'll see later how, how this helps us to get sort of the worst case running time of these unit and find operations down. And we'll, assume, we'll see that we do this sort of at the cost of the find operations. So, so far, find was free for us. We just had to you know, jump back on this on this back pointer. Now we're trying to get the log V bound time. Um, uh, down for, for the union operation in the worst case, and we do this at the cost of raising the running time for find, again, also to a, to a logarithmic running time. So let's see how we do that. Um, the idea is that we represent our sets now using rooted trees instead of uh, linked lists. We can represent a set with uh, a rooted tree. And this is... Uh, very simple. So if we have a single element in our set that contains, let's say, A, simply have a node A. If we add an element B to that set, we would simply add a node B that points towards the node A. And if we add a third element to our set, we have A, B, and C. Then we uh, can do this in two different ways. We can either attach C also as a child of, of uh, A. We can say A, and then have both B and C points to A in this tree. Or I could simply attach C as a, a child node of uh, B. So I we have A, we have B pointing towards A, and then we have C pointing towards B. Okay, this is a sort of a very simple way to represent sets using rooted trees instead of uh, linked lists. To distinguish internal nodes from the root nodes and to be consistent with uh, sort of the additional information that we will store per node, we will, we will make sure that the node, the, sorry, the root node will point to itself instead of any other nodes. So A will, in this case, always point to itself instead of any parent node. And this is how we recognize that whenever we reach a node in this tree, that this, this, that this node is actually the root because the parent of that node, of that node is the, the node itself. And uh, this, this uh, parent relationship, we will denote by 
uh, pi of x, so pi of x will be the parent node uh, of x. So in this way, a pointer, think of a pointer. Um, and the root node we said, we will define this relationship to be a simple a pointer to itself. So the root, for the root nodes, uh, this is the x such that the parent of x is equal to x. So this is how we identify a root node in our tree. In this particular example, uh, pi, the parent of A would be A, parent of B would be A, and the parent of C would be B. And this here, based on this definition, parent of A equal A, we know A is the root of this tree. And in this way, we will use now the root of this tree as a representative element of our set. Instead of using the first element in, in linked lists that is pointed to by, by the head, now we simply use the root node of the tree to be the res representative element of our set. And if we are don't, if we sort of do this in a naive way, if you don't, if you're not careful exactly how we design these algorithms, these trees, and, and notice that we had here two different choices, how we could build such a tree. If you're not careful how we do this, we might end up actually with the same sort of linked list or linear chain of elements uh, that would just you know, stretch uh, along a single path. And in this case, you wouldn't benefit in any way compared to a linked list. So we have to make sure that we, we yeah, preserve a certain structure or, or keep the, the trees shallow as we will see. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, that's the idea that uh, we will see that we need to keep these trees shallow because they will, the, the depth of the tree will define the running time of our operations. And uh, keeping the tree shallow then will, will make the, the running times faster. But we will be, we're, we're getting there. Um, so, so far we haven't talked about any of this. It's just uh, the, the concept of a tree and, and the root. And now let's, let's see how find in this case would work. And then you will probably see what, what it means with the, the depth of the tree, how the depth of the tree um, impacts the, the, the running time of your operations. So in, in this case, we're looking at the find operation. Is how do we implement find using this uh, tree representation of sets? So essentially in find of X, we have to look for the, the root node of the tree that contains X. Um, and the way to write this down is very simple. So we will as long as X is not the same as the parent of X, meaning as long as we have not reached the, the node of our tree, we will simply set X to be equal to the parent of X. We will jump to the parent of X and we keep, to, keep on doing this until we hit the, the root of this tree. And once we're done with this file loop, we simply return X. So here's an example how this finds uh, uh, works. Let's say we have the following tree. We have uh, node A as our root, and we have uh, D and E pointing to that root, and we have another node uh, B. And below B, we have D, and below D, we have F. And so if we call find of F, we're starting here from this element F. And we want to find the representative element for the set that contains F, meaning we have to find the root of this tree, in this case, A. We simply keep on walking upwards towards the tree. So we would start from F, consider the parent of F, we end up at D. Then we consider the parent of D and would end up at B. And then we take the parent of A and end up in A. And once we're trying to look at the parent of A, We'll notice that the parent of A is equal to A, and we, have, we know that we have reached the node of this tree. 
And so in this way, you can see that the, the, the number of operations or the, the running time of find will depend immediately on the length of the path that you have to traverse from the leaf to this node. So that would the number of operations here uh, is equal to the depth of the tree. And in our case, this is three. So we have three hops in this, in this particular example. And this shows that the time that we need for this operation is proportional to the height. And therefore, we were trying to keep this height small and we try to keep these trees shallow. Uh, and we need to do this in the, in the union operation because union is the operation that ultimately builds these trees. Because as you saw in, in make, we sort of built this, this uh, singleton trees that only contain single vertices. Find doesn't change the tree, it only traverses sort of the path towards the tree, towards the node. So the one operation that builds these trees is the union uh, operations. We have to make sure that union gets us treated are shallow and uh, therefore help us speed up the find operation. Yeah, so let's have a look at an example of, uh, of this union operation. And uh, let's see how we can keep these trees uh, shallow using union. So let's say you have uh, the following two sets. You have a set containing A, B, and C. And they are uh, basically a linear stretch, a single path in this case. And the one, you want to merge this set with a set that contains elements D, F, and E. And the structure that F and E are both siblings of this uh, same node D. And so now to build the tree that represents the union of these two sets, we will touch one of the roots uh, as a child of the root of the second tree. So we can either let D point to A, or alternatively, we can let A point to D. Any, do you have any preference for that? Would you prefer one variant over the other, or does it, does it matter? So we would, we would let point D, uh, uh, D points to A because D is, uh, uh, has a, a lower height and therefore the height of the resulting tree will actually not change with respect to the height of the first tree. Um, you sort of can hide the smaller tree in the, in the larger tree. Whereas if you would do this the other way around, the height of the resulting tree would be larger than, than the maximum of the two, two trees. So the way to do this in this particular example is to let um, to, to keep this first part of the tree unchanged. So B will still point to A and C to B. And then we let D point to A and we still have F and E point to D. Okay, so this is sort of the first heuristic that we that we use to speed up this uh, this representation of uh, sets by by rooted trees. I mean that you always want to touch the smaller. Is the microphone still working? Okay, so we are always attaching the smaller to the onto the, the larger tree. Touch the smaller rooted tree to the larger one. That's the find operation. Take too long. 
So this is a sort of a vague description of this idea. Now, and instead of every time computing the height of a tree explicitly, we store some additional information in these nodes that help us to determine the height of the tree, which we will use, uh, which we will call the rank of a node. So here's a definition. So the so-called rank of an element X is simply the number of edges in the longest path from X to a leaf node uh, uh, subrooted or in a tree subrooted at X. So from X to a leaf in this subtree. Okay, so in, this, in our example here, uh, the height of the first tree or the rank of A in this case, the rank of A in this case is two because the path here is two. The rank of D here is one because the maximum path length below D is one. And the rank of the new tree would be still two because the maximal path here is still two. So we haven't really increased the maximal length of, the, of any path in the tree rooted in A. And that's why the rank of A remains uh, two, equal to two. Okay, so now if you wanna <clears throat> define the make set function, it's very simple based on everything that we have defined so far. If you wanna make or create a set that contains a single element V, what we have to initialize is the parent relationship of V in the beginning, V will be a single vertex, so the parent of V will be equal to V. So we set phi of X equal X. And we will set the rank of X initially to zero. Because there's no path really under, under this node. Okay, and this is clearly taking constant time. There's really, this is sort of a trivial operation. It gets more interesting now once we're looking at the union operation. Um, so we have um, given an example how we would do this. We would always attach the smaller tree to the larger. And using this rank information to determine the depth of the tree, uh, the, the function that performs this, this, uh, this union operation is called union by rank. Union by rank. So this is how it works. And this is basically what we already discussed um, in this example. So this is defining the function union of uh, X and Y. And so in, in order to merge the two sets or to, union, to, to unify the two sets that contain X and Y, we first have to find the representatives of the two sets because we need to know what sets we're really dealing with. And we can do this using finds. So find of X will give us the representative of the set containing X and find of Y uh, gives us the representative of the set containing Y. And this will be the root. Uh, this will be the roots of the two trees. So RX will be equal to whatever find of X returns. This is the root of this, the set containing X. RY will be find of Y. So the set representing or the representative of the set containing Y. And so if the two representatives of these two sets are identical, we know that X and Y are part of the same set and there's nothing to do. We don't have to merge anything, that it's already the same set and we can return. So if RX equal RY, uh, there's nothing to do and we can return. And otherwise, if the two roots are not the same, we know these are two disjoint sets. And the question is now basically what do we, which root do we attach to which one? And we have, we already came up with a strategy. Now we only have to formalize this based on, on the ranks. And we say that if the rank, so we compare the ranks of uh, Rx and Ry of the two roots. So if uh, the rank of Rx is larger than the rank of Ry. 
then I will attach R y to the to the root R x. So we'll make the parent of R y equal to R x. So that's what we said before. We take the smaller tree and attach it to the to the larger tree. And otherwise, so if the rank of x is not larger than r y, it's either smaller or equal. But in any case, it will make uh, the parent of r x uh, equal to the to the to the root of of y, so r y. So in this case, we set the parent of uh, r x equal to or why? Okay, this is sort of just uh, putting this intuition and this example into, into one function, yeah. Good question, yeah, this is exactly what's missing here. Um, and I wanted to ask you, um, but you already answered, so we have to update the rank. And in which case do we have to update the rank and, and, and how do we update it? When does the height of a tree increase compared to the two subtrees that we have merged? Yeah. The largest rank and the larger rank between the two, but so we had an example here, right? Let's see. So in this case, the larger rank here, you see the rank here is two. I mean, the rank of A is two and the, the rank of uh, D is one, but the rank of the new A that represents the, the union of the two sets is still two. So it didn't, it didn't really increase. We didn't have to change the rank of A. It, it remains two in this case, right? Yeah. Can you say this again? So you, in this case, in this case, right. So in this case, you're right. We don't have to update it, right? Because, and here, do you have to update it here? I mean, it's pr pretty much, it can be symmetric, just that the other one is larger, right? And then you just attach one to the other. Yeah, exactly. So that's the only case. If you take two trees and the two ranks are identical, then no matter which one you attach to which one, the new tree will have a, a height that, is, that has increased by, by one. And this is, this is also part of the, the else here. So the else also contains the case that the two ranks are uh, identical. And in this case, um, so if that's true, that the ranks are identical, so if rank of Rx uh, is equal to the rank of Ry, then the rank of uh, Ry, so that we are using, our, we, we are attaching Rx to Ry, so therefore the rank of Ry will increase by one. In this particular case, the rank of uh, Ry um, will be increased by one. Is that clear so far? Any questions? If not, let me copy the description of the algorithm again. I want to summarize the running time now. So these things, the running times of the, the first loop and the, and the sorting obviously hasn't changed. So here, make set. Um, we saw that we only have to create sort of these uh, these uh, trees with a single node with a root to it with a pointer to itself. This we can do in constant time, so the the whole the, the running time for the entire loop here 
will be order of the number of nodes. We have the sorting we said, which is O of uh, E log E, number of edges, which is the same as order of E log V. And so really the interesting part for us is this here, uh, which we will call simply, we refer to this as the second loop. And this is what we're interested in. So now let's, let's, let's have a look at what happens uh, once we have these, these trees and we follow the strategy of always linking the, the root of the, um, the node with the smaller rank to the root with the larger rank. Then in terms of ranks, the first thing we observe is the following. Actually, I can. So for all X, we have that the rank of X So how do you compare the rank of a node to the rank of the parent of the node? Is it smaller, equal, larger, plus one, square root? What's the relationship between these two? Think of the interpretation of the rank. Which one is smaller? X, X is smaller than parent of X. Yeah. No, X is in any element. I'm just trying to look at now what happens if I sort of uh, uh, go along a path, what happens to these ranks. And the rank of any node will be always smaller than the rank of the parent node. Uh, and it's important to, to note here that the rank of the parent node is not necessarily just the rank of X plus one, because there could be a different path in the same tree that is larger than, than the path of X. Okay. So the rank of X is uh, smaller than the rank of the parent of X. So observation uh, one, observation two, is that, uh, And this is what we already said, that the root node um, with rank K is formed from uh, the union of uh, two rank K minus one nodes, trees. So we said that already. <clears throat> and the third observation is and this is the critical observation here is that any yeah then it's equal yeah all right then it's equal. So let's say this is true for all X except the root of the, of the nodes. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, good observation. It's for all X except the root. Say smaller equal, but that's not really good enough. Then let's say for all X except for the root. Good observation. For this is true for all nodes except for the root. The second observation is what we said before that a rank K node is formed by merging two uh, K minus one rank nodes or trees. And now the second property can be used to show by induction that essentially any uh, root node of uh, rank K has at least two to the K many nodes in this tree. 
So any root nodes. K has at least two to the K nodes. And this is easy, very easy to show by induction for k equals zero. It's a single node. It contains one, uh, uh, one node. So this is true for k equals zero. And whenever you are at, uh, at k and uh, you, you form this uh, k rank k node by merging two rank k minus one nodes, those each one has two to the k minus one nodes. So two to the k minus one plus two to the k minus one is two to the k. And that's how you get this bound of two k. So every, every no, root node of rank k has at least two k to the power two to the power of k many nodes. Why is this important? How this is useful that we have lots of nodes in a given tree of a certain rank. Well, it means that k the rank can't be too large because uh, we have at most number of nodes many nodes. We have at v many nodes. So two to the k can be at most v the number of nodes, and therefore k can be at most log v. So this is the fourth observation here. Follows directly from the third one, namely that uh, since we are, since we have v many nodes, the maximum rank that we can have, and therefore the maximum depth of a tree, the maximum rank is log base two uh, of number of the nodes. Okay, and that's that's basically the, that's all what we want to what we wanted to show. Okay, so why why is this useful? Well, we know that we can't have any any very large ranks, and meaning we don't have any trees with a very large depth. So the depth is bounded by log v, and the depth we said also bounds the running time of our find operation. So find, in this case, will only take equal to the, lap, the depth of the tree, which is limit, which is bounded by log v. And in this case, we have a worst case bound on the running time of find by uh, log v, and not in the average cases before. So the finds will take now proportional to the depth of the tree, and we just said that the, the depth is uh, bounded by log v through an argument about the ranks of these nodes. So find will in this case take big O of uh, log V, which is the, 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 the bound on the depth of this tree. And similarly, the union, the union simply calls two times the finds for the two elements the way we wrote it down here, union is simply calling two times founds plus some constant work to attach one root to the other. Uh, other. So therefore, union will also take um, O of log V. So the second loop will take, in this case, The total time for the second loop will be simply E log V. So we go through all edges, and for every edge, we have to call finds or unions which take log V. So that the running time of the second loop will be O of uh, E times log V. And it's also the, the total running time. So we have sorting E log V, we have the second. Uh, loop E log V. So the total running time of this algorithm is E log V. And you can see it's not any better. So we put a lot of effort, but we really didn't get anything anywhere. So we have the same total running time E log V. 
What's the point? Well, the point is that we can do this now uh, in the worst case. So this is, so no operation here will take longer than log V in this case, uh, compared to the previous implementation with our sorted list where it can happen that some operations take longer than others. And just on average, we had this, this log V argument, but now really it's the, it's the worst case running time of, uh, of fines. Okay, so that's the, the main difference. Um, we can do even better than this uh, using trees. So this is not the end of the story. Um, I said there's two heuristics that you can use to make these rooted trees really work very well. The first heuristic was this uh, union by rank, where you always attach the smaller rank to the larger rank. And we saw that this gives you a worst case bound that is the same as the previous one. But you can do better if you are a bit more careful in maintaining this data, this, this data structure uh, in order. Um, this is sort of a different view of, of, uh, of maintaining this data structure because the way you do it is not, you want benefits sort of instantaneously from, from this modification, but only in the long, in the long run. Um, so you will try to do, make some investments in this data structure that's, well, that you, one can show benefits you in future operations. That's why also this, this uh, what I'm showing you very briefly here, requires a very specific kind of analysis where you consider a sequence of, of operations and then you try to um, show something for the average uh, running time of the operations in the sequence. But since it's so um, intuitive and so, so uh, powerful, I wanna sort of sketch the idea without any, any formal analysis of this, of this method. Uh, and this method is called path compression. So this is the second heuristic that we, that we will use on top of our uh, rooted tree representation of these disjoint, disjoint sets. So path compression essentially means keep your data structure uh, in shape. And um, so here's sort of an example. I'm gonna show you this through an example. Let's say you have the following tree. Representation of your sets. We have element A. We have element C pointing to A and B pointing to A. We have B pointing to B and D pointing to D, also pointing to D. Okay, and the idea is once we're calling a find operation of find function, we will remember the path. So we walk up the path, we will find out what the root is, what the representative is, and we will use this to store this information for all nodes that we have passed along this path in the way that we simply attach every node that we have touched in, in along this path, we attach it directly to the root of that tree. So this is, uh, let me just draw this, I think it's easier than. So if you now call, for example, find of E. Previously we said we would just start at E and traverse this path towards the root, but now we do a little bit extra work. At the same time, we will take every node that we have touched on this path and directly attach it to the root of this tree. Okay, so we have uh, the new tree that will look as follows. We have A and we have uh, still C pointing to, to A. This is not, uh, not changed. Um, but now we indicate our path from before. We said find E. So we go from E to D, E to B, and B to A. So we will touch B to A as before, this hasn't changed. But now we will also attach E to A, the last node, and we'll also attach um, D to A. And D has underneath it still F. Okay, so every node on this path from E to the root will now be placed directly under the root, such that future find operations for any of these nodes will be much faster. And if you continue doing this, now if you say find of F, just to go uh, all the way. So if you do, um, this is what you get from find of E, when you call now find of F, what will you get? Well, you'll simply get a star in which all nodes are directly linked to the root node A. So C will be 
connected to A, B, and E, and E, and now also F. So all nodes directly point to the root of this node. And that means that any future final operation has constant time. You only have to jump one parent relationship from that node to the root node to find out which set contains this particular element. This is the whole idea. So subsequent um, find operations on this tree will be constant time. Now to show that this is really a general property of this heuristic and not just an artifact of this, uh, of this one particular example, you would have to resort to what's called amortized analysis, where you, as I said before, have to consider a sequence opera of operations of union and finds in this case, and you have to show that for a sequence of operations, on average, every operation takes uh, a constant time. But we're not gonna, not gonna do this. But let me write down basically the function that implements exactly what I have just uh, shown you. So the, the new find of X will do the following. We again have a Y loop and try to reach the, the root of our tree and which, which we test by comparing X to the parent of X. So while X is not equal to the parent of X, and here comes a slight difference. Um, you call find for the parent of X. So you try to find out what the set representative of your parent is and use this as your new parent of X. So I'll say something about this in a second. So P of X will be equal. So the, the parent of X will be set to find of the parent of X. And the return is not so interesting as the same as before. What's really interesting in, is, is this line. This is sort of this recursive call where you, tr where you call find for every parent of X. So again, you're um, walking up the path from a node to the, to the representative tree node, the root node of this tree, uh, through this recursive call. And once this recursion unwinds, you will always set the result of this find operation as the new parent of uh, the previous child node, meaning that you set this, that you shortcut that node and attach it directly to the root node of this tree. So this function does nothing else than, than, uh, than what I've shown here. So think of it as a, as a two pass. Uh, two pass method where you would first go from a leaf all the way to the root to find out what's the root of this uh, of this tree, and then you use this inform information to set every other node on that path directly to that root, and then future final operations then will be much faster. Okay, so that's the idea of um, path compression. But uh, so the analysis is not so it's not really complex, but it's uh, also not super easy and we would have to introduce amortized uh, analysis so we're, we're not going to do this but the bottom line is that you get down this this running time for the find and the union operations from a logarithmic time to a constant time now is it worth it that's a different question in our particular application maybe not in Kruskal, because you still have to sort the edges and for, for the sorting you have to still pay e log v so even if you do a really great job with this data structure and you can speed up this uh, second for loop and you're much faster based on this path compression and the union by rank. Overall, in terms of asymptotic runtime, you don't gain, gain anything. Um, is it useful then in general? It is. There's applications where maybe the sorting can be done faster for small edge weights or where you might end up already with a sorted uh, list of edges. So maybe you get this somehow for free, depending on your specific application. And then maybe you don't have to do the sorting and then sort of the bottleneck in the running time of your algorithm will actually be the data structure and not the, the sorting of these edges. 
for our particular case, it didn't really help much. Um, so across call still the total running time will be E log, e -log V, which will be the, the running time that you need for sorting these edges. Okay, any questions concerning union fines, um, path compression or, or cruise call? If not, then I want to, in this last uh, 10 minutes or so, give you uh, one alternative algorithm to find minimum spanning trees. So instead of uh, doing cruise call, we do something that is very, very similar to cruise call, but uh, uh, works yeah, slightly different. Um, the correctness is based on the same cut property that we have discussed last time. So remember in Kruskal, uh, essentially we, at each step, we have a collection of subtrees. And then in each step, we pick two different subtrees, which could be sing single vertices and connect them through a new edge. And we argued that this edge will be the lightest edge across some cuts that is consistent with our previous selection of, of uh, edges. And that's why it's safe to add this edge and continue adding this edge basically to our current set of edges to in the end obtain a minimum spanning tree. So the central or the way that this algorithm is, is uh, defined is really based on the cuts. And if you define the cuts different, a cut that still respects your selection and you, you find a different lightest edge across some other cuts, you immediately end up with a different algorithm. And this is exactly what Prem does so the Prem's algorithm will, in contrast to Kruskal, not collect or will not maintain a set of different partial trees. It will contain only one tree. And then in each step, you consider the cut that contains all the nodes of your current tree, and you pick the lightest edge that crosses this cut. So in intuitive, I mean, sort of visually, this is uh, sort of even simpler than Kruskal. You only have to um, sort of pick the edge, the lightest edge, connecting your current tree to the rest of the graph. And it works because of the exact same reason, because you have found a cut that respects your set of uh, edges. It's a different cut, but again, you're picking the lightest edge across this cut and that's why it's safe to add this one. Okay, so let me just write this down and go through one example and we're uh, done for today. So this algorithm that I uh, briefly motivated is called Prim's algorithm. As I said, this is very similar to Kruskal, except that it grows, uh, iteratively, grow, iteratively grows one tree. So similar, but uh, iteratively grows uh, a single tree. And as before, uh, we pick a cut that is consistent with our current set of edges, in this case, with our current uh, set of edges in our, in, in our single tree. Um, and pick the lightest edge. So for uh, the cuts that we're forming uh, contains all the nodes of your current tree. And then you pick the lightest edge that crosses this cut. This cut. So this is the exact same scheme that we had initially based on this, on this cut property, except that we define a different cut compared to uh, cruise color. So here's a, here's sort of a visualization of this idea. Let's say you so far have selected the following tree in your graph. Okay, this is your current tree that you have grown so far. And this is part of a, a larger graph with more, many more vertices. And then in this general scheme, in this cut property, we said we have to pick a cut that is consistent, that respects our current set of edges. And now we're simply, simply uh, picking the following cuts. We pick the cuts that contains all the nodes that we have connected so far in this tree. And then we pick this, the edge, the lightest edge crossing this cut. So meaning the lightest catch, uh, edge that connects 
a node in our tree to a node outside of our tree. Okay, so this is the whole idea of cream. Pretty much it's exactly the same algorithm. But just to illustrate it, let me give you uh, one example and you will see how, how this works in practice. Let's say you're given the following uh, graph. This is uh, very similar to an example that we had before. Okay, this is our graph and uh, it has the following weights. We have, oh, sorry, weight of uh, four, weight of eight, weight uh, 11, eight, seven, six, one, two, 14, seven, four, two. Get any? No, that should be it. So let's see how, how Prem works in this case. Uh, we can start from an arbitrary vertex. And uh, let's say we start from C. Okay, so we start from C and we have to pick the lightest edge that connects C to the rest of this graph. In this case, this will be edge one, this weight one. So now we have a tree spanning C and E, and we're trying to find the lightest edge connecting C and E to the rest of the graph, which will be the edge between E and H of weight two. Next edge in this case would be which one? Can someone dictate me how I should continue with these edges? Four, weight, weight four. And the next one? Two, right? Any other? Two, fell into my trap. So six here uh, is this one, right? It is the lightest that would connect. Well, an edge, or what it would connect two nodes in in your component. So this is not a this is not an edge crossing the cut. It will be within uh, a within S basically. So this is what we call S. Let me just write this down for consistency to previous classes. This is S. So in this case, edge with weight six would uh, connect two nodes within S and we can use that. The same is true for this edge of weight seven. This one we can also not pick because it again connects two nodes in our component. Uh, this leaves uh, an edge of weight seven that we can, uh, that we can uh, use here. And uh, next edge could be, no, yeah, we have, we can choose between two edges of weight eight, take this one. And the final edge here is an edge, an, a weight, an edge of weight four that connects eight to this component. And we have reached all nodes or connected all nodes in this tree. So this is pre, how Prem works. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's based on the same general greedy scheme of, of the cut, cut property, except that it uses or defines a different cut uh, that respects our current set of edges. And correctness follows from the exact same arguments using the cut property that we have described last time. Any, any questions? Yeah. What if what? See it. So you said uh, DG and DB. So whenever there's two edges of the same weight, you can pick any of the two. I mean, this is also following directly from the cut uh, property. Uh, the lightest edge that you're picking doesn't have to be a unique one. It has to be a lightest edge really across the cut and then you're safe to edit. So if there's more edges that have the same minimum weight, you can pick any, of the, any one of them. Good. 
And if there's no more questions, thank you and see you on Thursday. Yeah. How much time do you have on you? Sorry? How much time do you have on you? Now? Yeah. Um, almost uh, zero. Right. What is it about? I mean, I have oh, um, office hours tomorrow if you want to have a longer chat. Oh, for sure. So, no, I just had a second.